Hello, and thanks for tuning in to today's Goop Book Club conversation. I'm Elise Goop's Chief Content Officer, and I'll be leading the conversation and then eagerly anticipating and waiting for questions from you all. So don't forget to drop them in the chat box and we'll get to as many as possible. If you're new to the Goop Book Club, welcome. We hope you'll enjoy it. And also note that we have a fairly robust Facebook, Facebook page going um, if you want to dive deeper and talk about the book some more. You can learn more about the book club and our Facebook group at goop.com slash goop book club. So I'm very excited to be talking with Tony Jensen today, who wrote this stunning and moving memoir. Tony teaches in the MFA programs at the University of Arkansas and the Institute of American Indian Arts. She is a 2020 recipient of a Creative Writing Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. And her first memoir, Carrie, traces Tony's Métis roots, her childhood in rural Iowa, her closest relationships, and the classrooms she's inhabited around the country as a student and a teacher. Her experiences ladder up into something larger, an exploration of indigenous history, American culture, different forms of intimacy and violence, and the subtle and lasting ways that language shapes each of us. It is also very much a commentary on guns. I'm eager to talk to her about all of this. As a reminder, we're joining you live, so sorry in advance for any tech glitches. They happen, we try to recover, stick with us. Tony can answer questions in live time, so please submit as they come up. Um, they'll send them our way and we'll get to as many as possible. And per usual, at the end, I'll be announcing our next book club pick. So stay tuned. Okay, now please welcome Tony Jensen. Hello. Hello. Um, I was talking to Tony before we went live, and then I had to be ushered away because we were talking about too many things that I wanted to ask her in front of all of you. So first of all, congrats on the book, Tony. It's, I'm sure, um, quite an emotional present to deliver in the midst of everything else that's happening in the world. But it's also, um, as I was saying, the only book or the first book, I'm certain it will not be the only, but it is the first book to really comment as well, a little bit on COVID, but more on George Floyd. So it was really interesting to hear your perspective on that. Um, so for people who haven't read Carrie yet, can you give us a little bit of background on your family, your upbringing, your Métis, Métis roots, and anything else that sets the stage? Sure, yeah, I'm Métis, as you say, which is just a mix in my case. Um, uh, my family, that part of the family is from Alberta, and so it's just a mix of indigenous heritage with Irish generally, or sometimes French. Um, and so, my family traveled back and forth from Alberta to rural Iowa for generations before settling pretty much for good. Not everybody, but a large, a large section of the family in Iowa where I grew up. And I grew up in a no stoplight town in South Central Iowa um, with my family. And my dad, yes, is a card carrying NRA member. He's someone who always liked to hunt and he worked a trap line and so hunting, fishing, being on a trap line, um, you have to take a gun along to the trap line generally in case something you've caught has to be shot. And so guns had a very practical, um, everyday kind of purpose in my life, but there was also always the threat of guns and gun violence too, because we had domestic violence in our household. So um, I grew up also with my grandmother and her really strong and beautiful influence and I think that that's part of what really made my childhood unique and special, um, especially these days when people live often far from relatives that I got to spend so much time with both my grandmothers. So yeah, a very small town upbringing, um, situated in the middle of the country, in the middle of gun culture. So that's yeah. a little bit about that, yeah. And the book is, it's not predominantly about your dad, but he's a major, force in the book um, and the way that you recall your relationship and the abuse. Um, and also there's a lot of love in it. It's it, I thought, you know, we were talking again earlier about how the book felt 
um, which I think is probably really hard to do. Like it wasn't written from a fresh wound that you were able to approach him and approach your relationship from a place of healing. Um, but at the same time, it's interesting because I don't know if you would agree with this, but the person who is written about in some ways is the least is your mom. And, um, and I, I was just curious about that because in reading several sections of the book where you, particularly after when your dad has sort of, one, she was witness, right, to the physical abuse and she herself experienced near drowning multiple times, I think, or he attempts to drown her. But um, you talk about, you know, near the end when you, when you talk about the scene where he tried or to throw you through a window and that no one came to check on you. And there was a certain amount of complicitness, right? And that your mom sort of would remark about how you were a troubled teen or a troubled kid. You sort of denounced that regardless. Is that, how do you, how do you handle that now? I mean, do you, because it feels like your dad in a way you put into a box, but to me, it felt like your, the relationship with your mother wasn't as reconciled. Is that fair? Yeah, no, that's entirely fair. And, you know, she, she read the book. Um, I sent it to her the week before when I got my, my copies um, and so my advanced copies. So she read it the week before everyone else did. And she got it and read it straight through till like four in the morning. And so I heard about it straight away. And, you know, she's sure that that night she did go to check on me and it's possible I was asleep. So, you know, um, but while I was awake, no one did. I, so perhaps we'll have to add awake in um, to a later draft. So we still have that kind of relationship where, yeah, we don't agree on everything. And it certainly is not always easy, um, big things, small things. We agree on politics and we talk a lot about politics. We usually agree on what makes a good mystery novel. She reads voraciously. So we talk a lot about mystery novels um, and we agree on the facts of family history, the basic facts too, about my dad in particular and who he was. And not everyone in the family supports that narrative. And so we're close despite, you know, early difficulties. We're also probably quite a lot alike temperamentally in many ways. and. You know, I say to her pretty often, she said it was, she liked the book, but it was difficult to read, um, as I can well imagine would be true, right? Uh, so, you know, I think that we have common ground over that she liked the book and where we part ways a little bit are just some nuanced things. So really, I was very moved by how grateful she was that the portrait was honest. And she feels like this is an important subject that people you know really need to be more open about and that the whole world would be better if we were all talked just a little more openly about all these subjects so i think that that's part of it yeah and you certainly talk i think it's about your sister and sort of her her family and having been involved with the i think you say essentially a cult leader but like this idea of what happens behind closed doors and how often what's most unsafe is private Right. And these yeah. these domestic scenes that happen sort of across cultures in this country and around the, the world that are silenced or ignored or justified, um, that those are the most pernicious. And until we start talking about them, no one knows what's happening. Right. And no one knows that it's often a shared experience. Yeah, I've been surprised how many people I knew in childhood or early adulthood who read the book and said, I had no idea we shared these experiences. People in my little tiny town, um, most of the town, it seems like, or most of the people I know anyway, have read it or are reading it or plan to read it, which is uncomfortable, I will admit, because it's a very small town. But I'm hearing, that's the dominant thing I'm hearing, is that they're surprised to learn this. Some of them, some of them are not but that they had those same stories. And so I think once we start talking about it, that's the experience most of us will have that other people also have those stories. Yeah. And so much of the book is about whiteness, right? And being able to, being sort of white adjacent or passing as whiteness. And you talk about this, you don't mind if I read a section in the context of your dad, because of course, 
you're also trying to, you're giving an honest depiction that you're, I think, crystal clear about the stereotypes that prevail in this country. Um, so you write, there's a danger in writing about my father's drinking. I know this. Native men, including Métis men, so often are depicted as drunk, hopeless, more drunk, more hopeless. My father is Métis and also he drinks. We're far from culture and homelands here in Iowa. We're not returning. My father's drinking is about many things, not the least of which is the pressure to fit in, to comply with the dictates of whiteness. When I show him day drinking then, please note there are other day drinkers lined up beside him on their stools. Please note all of them are this thing America calls white. They are all striving to be better at whiteness, at prosperity, they are all failing. Which is beautiful. Um, but can you talk a little bit about this? This You sort of warn people before that section not to mistake your story for something it isn't. Yeah, I've had several of my former students from II who are white passing or white adjacent, and even some who aren't reach out and say that's the part they appreciated, one of the early parts of the book they appreciated the most. And I think they appreciate it probably because that is a mistake that's so often made. You see it in reviews about Native people's writing. You see it in um, summaries. You see it in classrooms. You see it in book club chats, I'm sure. And so it's just a common misconception that when Native people are drinking, that it's some sort of you know deep-seated character flaw within Native people. Many, many Americans, white, black, brown, all struggle with alcoholism and so and with drinking problems that perhaps wouldn't meet the criteria for alcoholism so you know i think that that when the brush strokes are so broad we lose the nuance and we lose the characteristics of the person my dad was sitting on that stool drinking um and so were all those other people and yeah it was hard the, i write a lot about the reagan years and people's farms being foreclosed on and my grandmother's passing away during that time period too and so it was like the very ground beneath us became shaky um, for one of the first times. And I think people are going through that right now too. And so to have too much judgment or to make that um, about a culture or a people or a race, I think it's deeply unfair and flawed because we don't turn that lens back on whiteness. Of course. Um, one of my fa very favorite people, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he lives in Vancouver, his name is Dr. Gabor Mate, and he, he looks at addiction and ADHD and he works a lot with First Nations people, and he's very quick to suggest, to sort of um, not disparage the cultural part of it, but to say essentially that it's a trauma response. And so you're talking about people who you know, have extreme inherited trauma um, of every variation have been, as you say, what exactly, what's the language, um, removed, the passive voice removed, right, from their land by gun, by bayonet, um, and suffered for, you know, the first genocide of this country and Canada, complicit as well. And that a lot of these things that we then turn and judge people for is essentially a creation of white supremacy and and trauma, right? And so um, I don't know. I love I love his perspective in general because I think it just changes the conversation and makes it less about your dad as an addict and more about him responding to whatever. I mean, do you know, sort of understanding where he came from and his story, does that, does that define, does that help, um, not define, but when you know how he was, does that make sense to you? It does in a sense, but I think also the majority, it's not at all, I wouldn't say the majority, but it's not at all uncommon for people in rural America, men of that age, to go home instead of going home to go to the bar and drink. Um, and so the problems in the marriage that were unaddressed, you know, the problems in their careers or their workplaces, all those things, it's so much easier to stop and drink, they think, you know, than to go straight home and face 
not having enough money to face an angry wife to face you know the kids being unruly or the kids being terrified or whatever's going on at home and so that's the case in many american households and so yes certainly some of it has to do with cultural and inherited trauma that's passed down but also a lot of it just has to do with part of how you fit in in small american mostly white towns if the men all go to the bar and have a few drinks before they go home it only becomes a problem right if a you can't afford it and b you can't stop and those were the situations that we were in um not everyone was in those situations but but almost everyone's dad quite a few of the dads lined up at that bar and had drinks every day or many days so yeah. i mean i just think it was a really common phenomenon that only became alcoholism for a few yeah no and as you write about that time there was a lot of despair in the air and there is still to this day um yes. but like when you talk about sort of the trapping of um let me see if i can find my note on it oh like here is the thing about rabbit or squirrel cooked without love cooked out of necessity cooked with embarrassment over the necessity it is dry stringy horrible cooked with love say at a grandparent's house by someone other than a mother, it tastes like anything else. It is food like any other. It is not the mother's fault. She wishes for grocery store chicken, plucked and clean and bearing the marker of the middle class, the cellophane pulled tight by unseen hands. Because your memoir is about so many things, so many things, and yet it's, and it's also about class and poverty and lack um, and, and that sort of despair that comes from it, which I think was, you know, as you say, cross-cultural, right? Um, you know, my mom grew up in Iowa in lack too, Catholic family, um, too many kids, love them all. But um, it is a really interesting commentary on the day. And then to the NRA, and I did not know the story of I knew the story, I knew about the NRA in the context of um, that it had been sort of singularly focused on hunting and portraying these idyllic hunting scenes. And then it became highly politicized with Reagan, right? And yeah. um, that story about, um, what is his name? Herbert? Harlan. Harlan, yeah. that he was, convicted of murdering a man. I mean, what the hell? That yeah. is such a wild story. And why, I understand yeah. why you told it, but can you talk a little bit about the way that guns show up throughout the book? Sure, I mean, from the, the beginning of history, when, when, when I say things like, you know, the Cherokee were removed or um, the Choctaw were removed, right? We don't, that's how we, that's how we talk about Indian removal. Um, in this part of the country anyway, in the Southeast. And I think that's still how it's taught mostly in history books. And so the idea that they were removed, well, at gunpoint, right? Or, well, she went into the truck with him and then no one saw her again for four days um, or, or forever in more contemporary context with missing and murdered indigenous women. Well, why did she get into the truck? Usually it's by force, usually it's at gunpoint. Um, and the NRA, the way that the messaging shifted during the Reagan era, I think is especially interesting. At the same time, you had Rush Limbaugh and others going on the airwaves for the first time, pushing a certain narrative of what America was supposed to be like. And then the other way the NRA is pushing this new narrative that now guns are supposed to be about keeping your family safe more than they were about shooting rabbits or shooting birds or shooting deer. And so we had this cultural shift during that time when in the middle of the country anyway, which is certainly gun country, people also were losing their family farms and all of our agriculture was going corporate for the most part. So it was a huge seismic shift that I think is under discussed, under reported, under narrated for sure. And my family story is part of that story. So that switch in gun culture, yeah, it's easy to locate it back to, to the Reagan era. Yeah. And I grew up in Montana and same thing, gun racks, gun culture um, is still sort of very apparent. Although I feel like it had faded until, which I know is not true, but then it feels like it came back sort of with a, a vengeance or maybe there was more mingling in town. I went home a couple summers ago and there's a farm from Missoula, which is this the, a liberal college town. 
and um, and there's a farmer's market and there was a actually a pride parade that day and we were downtown at the farmer's market and I had my youngest was just a baby and my husband and I were like, oh, we should move move here. It's so wonderful. And then I looked over and there was a guy with um, his wife and a baby and I just looked at them, totally normal, and he stood up. He was carrying a gun. And, um, you know, I was like, right. Like, this is, I am in, still in Montana where gun culture is predominant. That said, most guns, all of the people I know who hunt are gun sense, in support of gun sense laws, are appalled by the NRA. Um, as are a majority of Americans, but still, you know, people have access to guns in a way. Kids I know were accidentally shot, and you talk a lot about sort of the living next to gun violence, being fear, afraid of gun violence in the context of your dad having a, an arsenal of weapons, um, and that we are all complicit. We're all however many degrees apart from one of these crimes, whether domestic or mass. Um, and we, we do, we try to sanitize it. We try to separate ourselves from it. We try to otherize it. Um, and as you point out, that story about the Tyson heiress, a majority of gun owners are white. I mean, we know this, this is also, you know, we know that the mass, the people committing mass shootings in America are white men. Yes. Yeah, statistically that's accurate. That's, that's the yeah. dominant. And it was a little surprising to me, I'll admit, that the dominant statistic for legal gun ownership also were were wealthy um, white men. So middle class to wealthy, 90,000 a year and up. Um, that was a little surprising even to me. I had some notion that that might be a higher percentage than most Americans like to think about, but that it was the dominant percentage was surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so we really, we really aren't doing ourselves any favor when the narratives are so um, much about the other and the other is never white and the other is always responsible for the violence because that, that is simply a false narrative, statistically yeah. speaking. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, 40% of people who own guns in the US are white and rates of gun ownership are highest in households, yeah, that earn 90K plus. Um, Let's talk a little bit about sort of, again, going back to this othering or not othering. And yeah. how do you imagine that we begin to solve for this? And, and then also within that context that, you know, your best friend from childhood who later overdoses, who says, you know, you know I'm, I'm part Kiowa. Um, and you're like, which part? Like your elbow, your knee? Can you sort of talk about, it's so funny, my kid's doing, um, they're doing Latinx heritage this month. And so he was like, what's my heritage? And I was like, I have no idea. I wouldn't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's complicated, right? So yeah. how, do you, how do we begin to think about that? I think simple steps, because I think those two things are related, how we think about guns, in relation to the other and how we think about ourselves as being separate from that. Um, there are several chapters where the gun violence is literally right next door. And though it's not inside my house, this is in you know, later chapters in the book and later sections of my life, it's hard then to ignore when it's literally right next door. But for most people, if it's not next door, it's in the neighborhood. It's a neighborhood over. Um, recently, there was a move toward parents asking other parents whether there were guns in the home before they let their kids go over. I think Moms Demand Action are the ones responsible for that narrative starting. And that's a good step toward a conversation. But for some people, at least where I live in the South, it was so taboo to even suggest that small of a measure. And it surprised me a little. Everyone just assumes that the NRA and gun culture has such strong hold on America that we can't even talk about who really has the guns and what they're really doing with them and why we have them. It's mostly a fear-based program. Yes, there are hunters who only have them for hunting and who support gun sense laws and they're to be commended 100%. But also 
that's not the dominant majority. The dominant majority of people do support gun sense laws, even gun owners, um, but we're not able to get it through the legislature. And why is that? And so I think thinking about the role of guns in our culture is broader than just you know who commits gun violence and why we're so attached to having so many guns per person in America. We're unique in that. And I think that can be investigated. And you're right that some of it perhaps has to do with the gap in knowing about ourselves, the gap in knowing about our neighborhoods and our neighbors, um, our own personal history. So there may be some connection between that, absolutely. Yeah, and as you say, I mean, it's funny, I shot guns this summer in, in Montana, because it's fun. It's fun to go and like shoot cans and mm -hmm. safely, but <laughs> um, you know, these things to become so extreme, whether it's guns or abortion or, you know, and I do think that the NRA has done a great job of turning this into a scary political issue um, where, as we all know, I mean, what is it like 90% of Americans want the government to take action and state, many states have taken some action, um, but it's ludicrous and it's the, you know, it's the NRA having hold, but it does trickle down to, um, and it is very classist, right? It is this idea of um, like, who would own a gun? And the reality is many people own yeah. guns, but yeah. it does and, certainly have that air. Yeah, and I think it's more visible in states like Montana and Arkansas where in Texas where people do um, concealed or open carry, because even concealed carry, you can often tell if you're looking, or you can really tell if you're looking closely. So absolutely, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's more of an issue, I think, almost in states where you can't um, conceal or open carry, that people are deluding themselves. I think in places like Montana and Arkansas and Texas, it's really hard to delude yourself because you look over, you know, um, on a public street and there's a gun. And so... We know, we know the guns are here, but um, I guess that might not be true every neighborhood, but I think mostly people know. But you're right, there are whole swaths of America where it's easy to forget, it's easy not to think about it if it hasn't impacted anyone you know. Um, yeah. I, think that pool, I think that pool is shrinking every day though, unfortunately. No, it is shrinking every day. And it's just interesting, it's like the context is everything, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, when you're in Montana and you see a truck with a gun rack, with rifles and someone in camo going to hunt, it's a very different experience than when you're at a Subway sandwich and someone has a gun. Yes. Um, or, in and, or in the workplace, exactly. And the fact that that's legal in so many states yes. and so many businesses is, what, and on campuses. I mean, you talk a lot about campus crime and campus gun violence um, and, it's such a weird, it's so violent and, you know, in its own subtle, insidious way. Um, it is such an act of violence, whether someone pulls the trigger or not. It's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's, I think that there's this notion, at least the people who push those, the, that gun bill forward, really believe that it'll make their children and their grandchildren, in some cases, safer on campus. It's a really interesting proposition. Safer from whom? Um, it's the question that, that no one wants to ask, I think. These are white legislators, and I think they're worried about, you know, undue influence by people who are not like them, right? And so, you know, I'm using the little air quotes because when you dig down even a little bit into what that means, it's just racism. The fear of the other is just racism. And so, now we have guns on our campus because of racism and, and undue fear. And, and yeah, it's unsettling, it's unsettling. And it's really should be racism against white people because those are the people who are committing these mass shootings. Yes. So it is a weird um, assigning of blame in an inappropriate way, certainly. Let's also talk about you know, missing and murdered indigenous women and the trafficking that's happening um, across, I mean, across the country, but primarily sort of in Dakota, Montana, places where there's all this fracking 
So can you, and it's, you write about it beautifully in, in pretty startling ways, but can you talk a little bit about what's happening? Sure. So anytime um, there's an extractive industry, pipelines go in and you have either fracking or oil extraction, if there's so, if it's a rural place, which it often is, um, like in the Dakotas or parts of Montana, Texas, um, Pennsylvania and the Marcellus Shale too, then man camps begin to open up little trailer parks or um, things like that, that, you know, temporary sorts of housing in the middle of nowhere, there's no 911 address for these places. Um, there's no sort of way if you're a woman who goes out, let's say, to one of these places thinking you have a cleaning job and instead the, the men there think you're there for sex or you think you're going to a party and instead, you know, you find a whole different sort of circumstance. You, if you still have your phone and you try to call 911, it's difficult to locate you, right? So there are structural problems with these man camps, I think, that don't get addressed enough. Um, and yeah, so women are trafficked. And there's a lot of other rates of sexual assault, rape, um, murder, but especially sexual assault and rape and trafficking go up exponentially around fracking sites. So that's one of the least discussed, probably, parts of the oil and gas industry, but it's prevalent and it's a it's a problem that's certainly not the only way people are trafficked for sex in the states um or throughout north america but but yeah it's a big part of it um yeah and i feel like only recently are people becoming more aware that this is happening i saw a staggering stat about native children i think it was like one in four or or the I can't remember, I'll get it wrong, but essentially bet between ages one and four, the most prevalent cause of death for Native children is murder. Um, let me find that, actually. Yeah, I don't know. That's terrible, if so. Um, but I feel like no one, I mean, not no one, but um, people haven't been paying attention, appropriate attention to sort of what is happening particularly to these women and kids on stolen land. Um, yeah. And I love throughout the book that you sort of not only talk about sort of who the land was stolen from as sort of one of the consistent themes throughout the book, sort of mapping the geography back to um, whoever was removed, but also the fact that you use the dictionary so what's, what was that about, sort of the defining of words? What was that, what were you trying to achieve? I think our language really sets how we think about or feel about a topic in many cases. And oftentimes I would be trying to explore a concept and Webster's definitions would be useful in going back historically to find how the words were first defined when they started often there would be a word, say, that came into the lexicon around the time of a war, and it would be a violent word. And I would think, oh, well, of course, you know, history is just helping create language. That's how language works. And so I thought that it would be interesting to share some of my finds with readers, mainly because they add a layer of complexity into what how the country was formed, how our thoughts about violence were formed in many ways, or how words evolve over time even. Basically, if words can evolve like that, there isn't any reason our thoughts and feelings and language around gun culture can't evolve like that. There's a point in one of the essays where I question if a domestic violence bullet um, enters the body any differently than a regular bullet, right? Because if you're shot by your husband, let's say, um, your husband probably gets a lesser sentence if you don't die because then it's not murder and it's a domestic case. And it's certainly prosecuted and treated differently. The media attention is entirely different. Um, if there's a mass shooting and it's five people and they're all in the same family, is that a domestic shooting? Is that a mass shooting? So basically I was hoping to get to the root of some of these definitions, and I know that they're legal definitions, but when we throw them around outside the courtroom, um, who are we serving? Why are we doing that? To what end? And 
is that carving up in the same way do our racial carving ups or that sort of a move that we make repeatedly in American culture. I mean, who's, who's being served by that? So that's part of why I included Webster's. Also, Webster's recently has become political on Twitter, and I love that. I love that so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. But this was obviously the book was before that, but but I, I feel very justified by how cool Webster's has become recently. I mean, language matters and yeah. words matter. And I think, you know, what we're living through is clearly sort of an attempt politically to pretend like they don't um, in a way that, you know, just coming off of the debate last night, like what, what was said matters, right? Um, yeah. And or what was not said, which was a not you no know, denouncing of white supremacy. Right. Um, and when you think about sort of where we're at now, and you think about people like your dad, I thought it was really, really interesting to hear you talk about his political evolution and the way that Reagan in particular, even though that the economy sort of destroyed the ground under which people like your dad stand, um, but how it shaped him and talk radio and so the politi politicalization of news sources. Can you talk a little bit about what you experienced as you watched that happen? Yeah, I was pretty young when all of that was happening, but we were a household before there was years who argued over which Democratic candidate, right? If you were gonna support so-and-so or so-and-so, and those were the good arguments. And then it was really a neat trick the Republicans pulled during those years, having Reagan run and be successful um, and come out on the notion of being the protector of America, um, when what he did, of course, was introduce more guns and more hate speech and more processed food and less and less um, financial stability and environmental and economic stability for the whole middle of the country. And so how that was accomplished was strategic and was brilliant political strategy, but it was very, very bad locally for many families. And so, yeah, what that felt like was a fracture or separation in many ways, because to buy into the notion that to be prosperous, you if you were a farmer, you had to buy all this equipment and you had to farm more and more and more land and you had to use more chemicals. That's what that was part of the bill of goods that people were sold. And you had to own more and more guns because you had to protect what was yours. And um, I question that in the book, you know, why why men with guns think that their families are theirs to own and protect in that way, like property. And that was an idea that that really separated the family because my mom does not believe in any of those things. Um, we always had a garden. We always tried to eat. Like we got our chicken from the grandparents' farm whenever possible. Um, you know, we had fresh produce straight from the yard. And she was really early on a lot of those ideas. So, so it was a big shift. And she's been a Democrat, um, a loud and proud Democrat for her life. So yeah, it was a, it was a big cleaving. Yeah, it's really interesting just to think about that evolution in some of these more rural states. Um, so one, I love this question from the audience because um, my family, not me so much, but big bird watchers. So can you talk about the bird references and why you included them? Are the birds connected with the idea of crossing borders? And I would add, or is it a connection to your dad? I think both, absolutely. I mean, honestly, they started pretty organically. And once you start, I published a few of the essays in literary journals or um, other spaces. And so once the editors start to notice the birds, you can't unnotice them. So where I think they came from in my subconscious, though, were a couple of places. My dad certainly being a hunter and also a protector of wildlife through different organizations. Ducks Unlimited is one of them that he belonged to. And so you know, it's a strange sort of concept, maybe for some outside of the middle of the country or the South, or maybe, yeah, I don't know, maybe there are people who belong to these organizations coastally too, but the notion of protecting wildlife 
so that there's more wildlife to shoot at, um, but also that you love the wildlife. I mean, it's very complicated. And I just grew up with all those sort of weird complications just being balanced like that, you know? And um, so that's part of it. I think birds are beautiful. And when you write a book like the one I wrote, you're gonna need some inherent beauty and birds are everywhere. So once I did that organically, maybe five or six times, I did start to move the birds in more strategically, absolutely. And that um, that's not a decision I regret. They do cross borders and they cross places that once were borderless, right? Whole swaths of territory that, territory that maybe once were Lakota land, for example, and now are demarked into states. They cross rivers, you know, um, all of the things that are talked about, water and land and people in place, the birds have been there for, and the birds still travel, not paying attention to those borders. So all of that is in there. And also the last thing I'd say about the birds, I found a note in an early piece of writing that I did not that long ago after the book was published, looking back through old files. And there was a little mini rant, just one paragraph about if men like Jonathan Franzen and everywhere I've worked, there's been at least one white man who wrote only about birds, um, can write about birds, I can probably write about birds because you know, it seemed like such a big luxury that they had their whole lives just to go out and watch birds and write about it. And some of us also have to write about social justice, or we feel we do. You know, we have to write about missing and murdered indigenous women and pipelines and all sorts of things that are just really vitally important to our lives and to our getting to live our lives. And so apparently at one point I had a lot of feelings about that and I don't even remember writing it, but that's probably <laughs> why there are so many birds in the book too. It's funny. I commissioned yeah. Jonathan Franzen to write a birding story for Traveler when I was an editor there. Um, yeah. That my parents, well. yeah, well. no, so and they fun. need, yeah. My parents yeah. also talk about sort of the bird watching and how it's a way one of accessing culture, but in a totally different way because you're not going to the temples, you're going to see the birds, but also about sort of the it's uh, really telling in terms of economic devastation and how um, how these sanctuaries and, and bird health is sort of on the brink. And um, yeah, I think they're, it's a fascinating sort of trope that's really relevant. And I just wanna say in defense of hunting, because again, I think we get really classist and judgy about it. And if you don't grow up in that culture, you don't understand it. But the reverence for public lands which typically is a not necessarily a political issue in more rural, it depends now with fracking and whatnot and carving up land to extract, it is. But access to public lands is a crucial issue in many of those states and hunting is often very humane. So this isn't tro trophy hunting, it's hunting, it's an unsanitized way, instead of going to the grocery store to get your saran wrap chicken, which you acknowledge as being part of the middle class, like you're actually um, participating in a natural cycle of death that many of us choose to ignore by just getting our meat from the grocery store. Um, so I think there's a lot of honor in it and having and loving animals and being a vegetarian for much of my life, there is nothing more excruciating than seeing deer when they're overpopulated and it's a heavy winter of snow, seeing deer, emaciated deer starving to death and dying. So as population control, um, I am a fan, but I agree, it's a really complicated, it just seems complicated. And, but I think that feeding your family in that way, there is a lot of honor in that and being close to death and honoring the animal by eating it. Like you talk about your dad not shooting that you don't shoot animals that you don't eat yes um, yeah yeah and he you know he would say you don't point your gun at anything you don't intend to kill and you don't and you don't um shoot anything you don't intend to eat and i think those are just generally probably very good good sorts of ways of thinking those are yeah good rules. but yeah, again it's like it gets swept up into this world of guns and we have to be able to be more nuanced about our conversations. What's appropriate yeah. and what's not. And um, what in some ways is not life affirming, but life sustaining and what is the opposite. 
Um, right. So I have a question from Sarah. I was mm -hmm. curious what emotions you felt while writing. Was the experience cathartic or uncomfortable or both? The uncomfortable parts for me mostly were writing about other people's bad experiences. I, by the time I wrote the book, um, I was writing from a pretty good place as far as my distance from my own experiences, even things that I lived through pretty recently. I think I had enough distance or I wouldn't have written about it if it had been too traumatic. There were heart racing moments, sure, and there were portions that were difficult, but really writing about my own things weren't as hard. I had a harder time writing about the things that happened to friends, family, former students. Um, yeah, when I read it, I realize how much more emotional I am about that because I get choked up and during those passages. So, And it was the same when I was writing it. I would get to the place where I needed to write a thing and I would go drink coffee or take a run around the neighborhood or you know, do something else, um, walk the dog. I mean, anything except writing the scene where the bad thing happened to someone I care for. So those were the hard parts for me more than my own experiences. Yeah. The other part that I thought was so um, really subtle and beautifully told was when you were talking about your ex-husband and you know the the conveyor belt and going to the grocery store when I don't know you were eight eight or nine months pregnant and being denied having no money and then when his family comes um, and he is off being an archaeologist for twelve dollars an hour or whatever and then his family comes and all of his sisters and he's like how does everyone how did everyone get here and then you realize that he came from enough and I thought that yeah. this passage um, I thought that those passages um, because this man comes from enough but he believes it's important to withhold from me both the enough and the knowledge of the enough he's been too prideful to ask his parents for help they certainly would have given has been withholding the certainty, perhaps, because he understands I come from less, as did most of our graduate school friends. I would never have entered into this relationship had I understood he came from safety, from financial material safety, and denied it to me while I worked and worked, while I carried and carried and carried our child. I would never have hooked my life to any man who came from safety and pretended otherwise. There is no greater betrayal than this pretending. Um, there's no... And then you talk about how there's no worse life than a pretending life. Can you talk a little bit about that, sort of that? I mean, I can understand why you were pissed, but also like why that was such a um, potentially marriage breaking moment. Um, I mean, I had a lot of health and physical complications during the pregnancy. I had just, and there, it comes up in, in that essay too, that I just had bacterial meningitis and was very, very ill. Um, and my doctor smartly said, the one thing probably, there are several things you probably shouldn't do in the next year and one of those is get pregnant. And then of course that's what happens three or four months later. And so maybe longer than that, six months later, that year though, in any case. And so, you know, it was just a tremendous physical strain and financial strain. When you, one of the dirty secrets of academia that we don't talk about, there are many, mind you, but one that we really, really don't talk about is that gap between when you get a job and when you start the other job, there is no money that summer. Generally, there's no health insurance. There's no anything by way of support. And then you arrive and you don't get paid. You start in August but you often don't get paid till September, October, not a full paycheck, and you don't get reimbursed for even moving expenses till then. So add all of that onto that just recovered or not quite recovered really from a major illness and then pregnancy. I think those are the reasons um, in part, like just that set of circumstances, um, why it hit me so strongly. But also I grew up in a house where we pretended to be way more functional than we were to have more financially. Um, my mom was just a master of doing a lot with just very little. And so, you know, we fronted pretty hard that we had a little more than we did and that things were quite a bit better than they were. Um, and so I didn't want to go back to that. I didn't want any part of that kind of pretending. Um, well, I know we're out of time. Thank you so much.
I can't believe we pulled this off with no technical glitches. It's a miracle. Yeah, it the really is a miracle. The Zoomers must be gone for the day. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us, Tony, and thank you for your book. And I cannot wait for whatever it is that you write next. Thank you, Elise. I appreciate it. And now I'm excited to announce our next book club pick, which is Just Like You by Nick Hornby. We had a lot of conversations. There were some contenders um, about what to pick, and we decided that we needed to do something funny. And so this is certainly the funniest book we've read for the book club so far. We thought we all maybe deserve to laugh and have you know, a few giggles with a legendary writer. Um, many of you guys may already know and love Nick Hornby for books like High Fidelity, About a Boy, and A Long Way Down, or his award-winning screenplays and Education, Brooklyn Wild, and State of the Union. So this just came out yesterday. It is an unexpected modern love story. It's clever, entertaining, and keenly observed. And like all Nick Hornby books, the dialogue is brilliant, the chemistry between the characters is palpable, and the social commentary feels both pointed and optimistic. So we hope you pick up a copy and join us. You can learn more about Book Club in our Facebook group at goop.com slash goopbookclub. And then we'll be back here with Nick on October 28th at 10 PT. We will update you if it changes at all, but he'll be joining us from London to talk. So until next time, stay safe, stay engaged, and um, I hope you get some restorative giggles. All right, see you next time.